evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Maggie Schultz. I am the education coordinator here at the Kickapoo Valley Reserve. Um, tonight we're going to have another p part of our Driftless Dialogue <coughs> series, so I'll get the um, ads out of the way first. This is provided as a free service to you thanks to a grant from the Ralph E. Newsom Kickapoo Reforestation Fund through the UW-Madison College of Agricultural and Life Sciences and the Friends of the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, and also it's supported by Badger Talks. So that's how we're able to provide this free for you tonight. Our speaker tonight is Scott Lind. He's a friend of mine and the chair of the KV KVR board. He is also a retired and licensed professional electrical engineer and master electrician who worked for 31 years in a, power, a variety of power and lighting design roles as a consulting engineer. He's also been a huge part of our push to become certified as an international dark sky area through the International Dark Skies Association. And he's um, also played a huge role in a lot of other projects here at the KVR. So we're really excited to have him here. Please welcome Scott Lind. Thank you, Maggie. Um, and thank you for your interest in, in this topic and coming tonight and to the reserve for the opportunity to speak. So this topic is really, topic is really critical right now because for the last 11 years, uh, Sky brightness has increased about an average of 10% every year worldwide. And measurements that John Heasley has taken out here as part of the pursuit of the International Dark Sky Park has confirmed that that's happening here as well. And you'll see some graphics I'm going to show in just a minute that demonstrates how much that's changed just in the last two years. So one way to grasp how fast things are getting bad is that if you think about a child that's born today and say they could see 250 stars, when they're 18, they can only see 100 stars. So the problem's getting, getting bad very quickly. But we do have the ability to turn that around, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. So for those of you from Ontario, you might know Mark Smith, the former uh, village president. And that's the quote from him to a reporter talking about uh, the dark sky park that we're trying to get uh, designated in this area and the effort in Ontario to reduce the amount of light at night up there. So we've been working for three years on that dark sky park effort, but now it's in jeopardy. And the reason it's in jeopardy is because when we first took measurements, John first took measurements, uh, we qualified. The area was dark enough, right? That's not true anymore. Just in the last two years, the amount of light in this area has grown enough that we have now exceeded that threshold. So if we're going to be successful in getting that designation, we have to reverse that trend. And so it's critically important that the information that you get tonight, and if you talk to me afterwards or anything else, we take that information and share it as widely as possible to try and get this change and get it back to being as dark as it was. So there's a graphic here starting in 2016. It'll transition to 2020 and you'll see very little change and then it'll transition to 2022 and you'll see the change that happens. I'll let that run. So when outdoor lighting is done wrong, this is what a map of the resulting light pollution looks like. The color scale at the bottom shows increasing brightness from left to right. You'll notice in the areas shown that none of the surroundings are truly dark. Even the area in blue from 2016 to 2020, which is part of where the dark sky park is proposed. The blue color is the minimum sky darkness requirement to get designation as a dark sky park. Every other color on this map is too bright. And each full step in color represents an increase in sky brightness of roughly 75%. So looking at how fast those things have gotten worse in our own neighborhood, for reference, La Crosse is in the upper left, Toma and Sparta up above, and Richland Center in the bottom right. Now we'll zoom in a little closer where we've got Lafarge and, uh, and Ontario at the bottom and top, respectively. So just a closer view. If you look at this as it transitions through, you'll see we met the criteria. We had the blue in 2016, we had it in 2020, and we've lost it in 2022. And this is a, a document, you can see the reference here from the University of Madison, a professor at the University of Madison who does this worldwide, tracking sky brightness. But John's measurements reflect the same change. So it's not just hypothetical, it's actually happening. So 
So unless you're an amateur astronomer, why should you care about this? There are many reasons, and if you do some research, starting with the darksky.org website, you can learn about the rest of them that are listed here. But because the protection and preservation of this land for all living things and not just humans is a priority, let's focus on that reason this evening. In my view, it's actually the most compelling of all the reasons. If you've read Pulitzer Prize winning author Ed Yong's book, An Immense World, you've already learned how human perception of stimuli are not the same as the other few million species that exist on the planet. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. I brought a copy with me to show you tonight. Uh, it's a great read, and it may change your view of the world. His book research thoroughly revealed the many impacts that humans have, including lighting at night. To quote from his book, we too quickly forget we don't perceive the world in the same way as other species, and consequently, we ignore the impacts that we shouldn't. We normalize the abnormal and accept the unacceptable. Remember that more than 80% of people live under light polluted skies. Many people have no idea what true darkness or quiet feels like. Within that experience, vicious cycles start to spin. As we desecrate sensory environments, we become accustomed to the results. As we push animals away, we get used to their absence. As the problem of sensory pollution grows, our willingness to address it subsides. How do we solve a problem that we don't realize exists? And from the darksky.org website, we can learn how artificial light disrupts the world's ecosystems. Because nocturnal animals sleep during the day and are active at night, light pollution radically alters their nighttime environment by turning night into day. According to research scientist Christopher Kaiba, for nocturnal animals, the introduction of artificial light probably represents the most drastic change human beings have made to their environment. And it goes on and on, just like that. So why do we have this problem? Let's look at the ugly truth. Too many newly installed and replacement outdoor light fixtures are what I call glare bombs, meaning they're not full cutoff, they're very bright, they're too blue in color temperature, and they're on when they're not needed. And you hopefully, not hopefully, but you probably have seen this just driving around the countryside, and you probably noticed a dramatic change, because I have just in the last two years myself. So before we go on, I've already used the term full cutoff. Let's define some terms. And it's technical, I know, but I just want to give you the, the, what, what the definitions are. To be classified as a full cutoff fixture, it must have an uplight value of zero, which we call U0. And this means two things, no light above 90 degrees and minimal light between 80 and 90 degrees. In this case, zero degrees is vertical and 90 degrees is horizontal. A lumen is simply a unit of measurement for the brightness of light coming out of a fixture. A foot candle is when you take that lumen and you illuminate a surface. So a foot candle is one lumen on one square foot of surface, assuming a uniform distribution. And finally, this is the last definition you'll need. Uh, color temperature, or more ac accurately correlated color temperature, CCT, which is measured in degrees Kelvin, is really a description of how white light is divided up in the spectrum. So it's a mix of different wave. White light is always a mix of different wavelengths. And so that color temperature gives you an idea of how much is red and orange and how much is blue and violet. And for outdoor lighting at night, we want red, red fixtures, not blue fixtures. And the problem is that LEDs all skew to the blue spectrum. So here's a perfect example of this problem. And it's really the poster child for what not to do. And I've concealed the identity here because I'm not picking on any particular business or any manufacturer or any installer. It really is a universal problem if you start looking around. This just happens to have it all done wrong in one place. So these particular fixtures are built so that they could be full cutoff fixtures. But they're adjustable, and in this case they were tilted up about 30 degrees. So if those fixtures in the front of the building were actually tilted back down, they'd be a full cutoff fixture and you wouldn't see that glare. You can't tell from this picture, but the road's at least four feet above the parking lot. And there's a green space of roughly 20 feet between the front of the parking lot and the edge of the street. And yet these building lights are lighting the street and the front of the houses across the street well into the gable ends of a two-story house. The lumens are far too high for the purpose 
and the 5,000 Kelvin color temperature just adds to the glare and the sky glow. I didn't use a flash. That's just what it looks like with those lights. So this is a reminder that even if you install full cutoff fixtures, they need to be installed correctly. And I chose this particular example because the houses across the street make it possible to easily see the massive amount of light that's spilled and wasted and the impact it has on neighboring properties. But I don't want anyone to come away thinking that the same installation in a rural area is any better, right? This just happens to show it to you. It's still wasted light, it's still spilled light. So as Mark said, you can get by with less lighting, just put it where it belongs instead of putting it up into the sky. So why is this happening? I think the glare bombs happen for several reasons. More light is better is a common myth, and LEDs are more efficient. And so that excess light is cheap by comparison to what it was in the past. And because most wall-mounted lights have traditionally had a front lens and weren't full cutoff, it's a habit to buy the same thing in an LED, even though the optical performance of LEDs eliminates the need to have an exposed lens. And I've got an example of that with me tonight right here. And many of the cheapest fixtures are not full cutoff, and they're only available in the high color temperature 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin temperatures. The negative effects of too much and too blue light aren't necessarily obvious, and they aren't yet widely known. But that's starting to change. And as people become aware of the consequences of installing these fixtures, I really hope that by sharing the information you get tonight, we can start to turn that around. So let's get started. There are really only five things you need to remember to do a better job with outdoor lighting. The first principle is useful, and it's the easiest and the most effective one. Don't install a light just because. It has to have a reason for being there. And I'm not going to tell you why any particular fixture should or shouldn't be installed. There's many, many reasons. But I'm just asking you to think really hard about it before you put one in. Does it really need to be there in the first place? The second principle is targeted. And it's really all about where the light shines and maximizes how much of the light is useful. Too many lights get installed without enough thought about restricting the area that is lit to only what's needed. At a minimum, properly installing full cutoff fixtures means no light goes up into the sky where it does no good. Here's a graphic that I think explains it pretty well. So even when a light is useful, there's always a consideration of how much of the light from that fixture is targeted properly. properly. Graphically, it, this is how it breaks down. The useful light area in this application is for the street and maybe for an adjacent sidewalk. Everything else is wasted. You see here that the glare zone, where you see direct glare in the glare zone there, does not include the area where the useful light is. There's always the problem of looking directly at the source. The goal is to eliminate the direct view of the source from everywhere else where it's not needed. And you do that by using full cutoff fixtures and mounting them as low as practical while still working for good uniformity. And we haven't talked about reflected light to this point, but it also matters and it's a good place to mention it. It's another reason why lumen output needs to be matched to the need. Without snow, the paved area may reflect only 20% of the light that hits the ground. But with snow cover, 90% or more gets reflected back into the sky. If you're successful in lighting only the paved area and the snow gets removed, it's probably not a big deal. But all the light that's outside of that useful light zone is going to be reflected in snow conditions, creating more sky glow. So I've used the phrase so far, full cutoff, and that's an industry standard term. But there are also more involved ratings for light fixtures. And they relate to wasted light and glare, and they're known as bug ratings, B-U-G. Bug stands for backlight, uplight, and glare. As I mentioned earlier, to be classified as a full cutoff fixture, it has to have an uplight value of zero. That means zero light above 90 degrees and minimal light between 80 and 90 degrees. The backlight rating is for light that projects behind the fixture. In this case, it's light going back towards the pole. The glare part is how bright the source is at various angles measured from vertical. The higher the brightness at any given angle, the higher the glare rating. And for our purposes, just remember the key thing is only to use only full cutoff fixtures and only install with the bottom parallel to the ground. Don't tip it up like the example I showed earlier. 
If you ever need to bring light out further, pick a different fixture that throws the light out further, and they're available, or mount it higher, and that'll move the distribution out further. Don't tip it up. So here's just a couple of examples. Uh, unshielded on the left, full cut off on the right. You can see how it reduces the glare. You can see an example of the, the shielding in the upper pictures that show a fixture that's got a sag, we call that a sag lens, where the lens hangs below the opaque top. And the representation on the right is intended to be a, a lens that's not below the opaque part of the fixture. It's, it's flush with the fixture. And you can still get the forward throw distribution even in that, even in that fixture. And one of the reasons that works, and not all LED fixtures are made this way, but the good ones are, is that each one of those LEDs actually has an individual reflector in it. And so you can aim every single LED, every little yellow dot you see in there, you can aim each of those individually in different directions. And that allows you to really tailor the distribution where it needs to be. And that's how you can throw light a long ways away and not throw light up in the sky or not give you the glare. So here's another example of why unshielded fixtures and glare reduce safety. Just like driving your car. If what you're trying to see is not directly in the pool of light, you don't see it, right? There's a person standing at the gate in both of these pictures. We just can't see them in the first photo because of the glare. Shield the fixture and take away the intense glare, now you can see them. So instead of high brightness, use full cutoff fixtures with lower lumens and better uniformity to make the things or people you're trying to see easier to see. The third principle is to only use as much light as the task needs. If you were gonna sit in a parking lot and read a book, you'd need significant light. But that's not why we have parking lots. The amount of light needed is only what's appropriate to navigate and for pedestrian safety. To prevent overlighting and to improve uniformity, use the right lumen package. Use the right amount of lumens on these fixtures when you pick a mounting height. And they vary by manufacturer, and these are just examples. But when you look at your choices, even within a given physical fixture size, start with the lowest output available. And only move up if you really need more light. And if, if, all, if most of you are here for residential applications, I can tell you that 99% of the LED fixtures that are sold today are brighter than they need to be for a house. You don't need that many lumens. So when you're out looking for fixtures for your own property, you should buy the lowest lumen fixture you can find. Right? Commercial, there are reasons for higher brightness LEDs, but in residential applications, I can't imagine why you'd need anything more than just the lowest, LED, lowest lumen output they sell. If you're replacing unshielded fixtures, remember to reduce the lumens dramatically because with full cutoff fixtures, all the lumens become useful and can be directed toward the target. When Alliant Energy changes the city from the old sag lens cobra head fixtures, if you're familiar with the old style street lights, when they change those to a full cutoff dark sky compliant fixture, they cut all the lumens exactly in half. So you get all the energy savings of going to LED and then 50% more. And the lumens on the ground and the streets don't change. If you go to Ontario, which was changed out a couple of years ago, that is a well lit village with those Alliant street lights. The lumen output from those fixtures is exactly half of what it was before. And when I took pictures before and after from Wildcat Mountain State Park, before I could identify almost every street light in that village. You stand in the same spot and take a picture today, you can't see the street lights. They disappear in there. What I can see is all the wall mounted LEDs that have been added since then, right? They, they stand out like crazy now. All right, the final principle, fourth principle is. Uh, Really, it's only something that became an issue when LEDs came in the market. Because prior to that, we had metal halide, we had a high pressure sodium, a while back we had mercury vapor. Those were really fixed color temperatures. You couldn't change the color temperature of those fixtures for the most part. So LEDs is what opened up this opportunity to change the color temperature. But even early LEDs were typically only available at very high color temperatures. But now we've got choices. And the right choices are 2700 or 3000 Kelvin. So we're going to look at color temperature, and night really isn't meant to be daylight, but we often judge our night lighting against the color of daylight. 
Daylight varies in color temperature, but ranges from 5,000 to 6,500 degrees Kelvin in the middle of the day. So these cold blues of the high Kelvin fixtures are not what we want at night, because night is not meant to be daylight, and living things have evolved over millennia to dark nights. Because of that, and the added glare they cause, don't install lights with a high correlated color temperature outdoors. Instead, use something much closer to sunrise or sunset colors. 3,000 Kelvin is a good compromise, but even lower value of 2,700 is more ideal. So for comparison, a high pressure sodium lamp is about 2,200 Kelvin, right? So two of the reasons that the higher blue light content is bad are scattering and the fact that blue light at night has biological effects both on humans and other species. Raleigh scattering is the reason the daytime sky is blue, and the effect applies at night in the same exact way. The shorter wavelengths like blue scatter more than the other colors, and the amount of scattering is an exponential, not a linear relationship to the wavelength. So having 30% more blue content in a 4,000 or 5,000, 4,000 Kelvin lamp, as compared to a 3,000 Kelvin source, provides a lot more scatter, which impacts both glare and sky glow. A key point in this slide is how much more of the glare-inducing blue light there is in an LED above 3,000 K. So let's start with the sodium content, right? So high-pressure sodium was kind of the default lighting we'd see everywhere before LEDs came into place. There was some metal halide as well, but a lot of high-pressure sodium, especially in rural areas, three to four times the blue spectrum in an LED than there is at high-pressure sodium for a 4,000 Kelvin lamp, right? And 30% to 50% more than a 3,000 Kelvin lamp. So this is a good place to introduce another topic, which is color rendering. The color rendering index value of a light source, which is abbreviated CRI, is a number on a scale of 1 to 100 that describes how true the colors are of whatever it is the source is lighting compared to the same colors under daylight. It's a completely different thing than the color of the light itself. Daylight, by definition, has a CRI of 100. The higher the CRI, the closer the colors you see under a light source will look to their true colors. So knowing that, it's important to note two things on this slide. First, that the higher blue content, 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin sources, have no color rendering advantage over the 3,000 Kelvin fixture. And second, even though a 3,000 Kelvin LED is closer in color temperature to a high pressure sodium, the color rendering is vastly superior. And oftentimes, I mention this because oftentimes I think people shy away from using warmer LEDs. They look yellow to them compared to these really blue white LEDs. And they think back to high pressure sodium and they know how bad colors looked under high pressure sodium and they're afraid to use a warmer fixture. But that's a false assumption. You can get equal color rendering with a warmer color temperature now with LEDs. And finally, many years ago, the lower color temperature LEDs had significant efficiency deficits by comparison to the bluer LEDs. And there was a valid argument to be made to use higher color temperatures for the lowest energy consumption. But today, that difference can be less than 2%. And given what we know about the harms from using these blue LEDs, that really is a negligible difference, especially when you consider how many overlit places there are. We're using way more light than we need to begin with. And finally, the fifth principle. It's about controls. So installing a photocell isn't the right approach. To help keep the skies dark, to protect nature, and limit problems with glare and wasted energy, you need timers or sensors and dimming controls. Motion sensors integrated into the fixture like these are a great option and they achieve the goal of matching the light level to the activity. I found these integrated sensors work well, and if you're working in a commercial building, there are energy code requirements that mandate these types of controls. So here's some rules of thumb. Obviously, always full cutoff. Always 2,700 to 3,000 Kelvin. If you can live with amber, Go with amber, go even lower. But for most of us, we don't want to live with amber. So 2,700 to 3,000 is a good compromise. A maximum of 1,200 lumens for these low fixtures that are near a door, right? You'd here, these fixtures out that I modified here at KBR are about 900 near the doors. As mounting heights increase, you can increase the lumens if you need to for the purpose. 
Always look at the distribution pattern. Always think about where the light's gonna go and how far it'll travel. And there are, I'll show you in a minute, there's some diagrams that help you figure that out. And it works best to buy integrated controls if you can. They're just simpler. Just buy the control built right into the fixture. So how do you go about buying the right products? So I've got this light on this tripod right here, which I'll turn on in a few minutes. Uh, I've got the box for that fixture sitting out on the table out front. But if you look at that, what I've highlighted in red there is if there's a viewing angle you can find with this fixture where you can see this lens, other than underneath, that's not a full cutoff fixture and you shouldn't buy it. It's that simple. Right? If the fixture is up in the ceiling, of course, you can stand down here and look at it. But when the fixture is like this at eye level, if you can see any part of the lens, that's not a full cutoff fixture. And the lens should not extend below that opaque covering because light will go up like this as well. So that's what you're looking for is fixtures of that type of design. Not this shape. It could be round. It could be anything. But that's what you're looking for is where is that lens? The other thing to look for is color temperature expressed as four digits followed by a K. And if you know, the, if the box only says some version of white, warm white, soft white, whatever it is, you don't know what that means, right? There's a lot of variability. There's no guaranteed definition of that. And any quality lamp you're going to buy or fixture you're going to buy today will have a defined color temperature. So if you don't see that, don't buy it. Again, just some more examples of language to look for. One thing I'll mention to you is if you can find them, uh, this fixture has it, for example. You can buy fixtures with adjustable lumen outputs. This fixture actually is adjustable both for color and for lumens. And the advantage of buying a fixture with adjustable lumen outputs is that LEDs, like any light source, degrade over time. And so if you have any anxiety about whether I'm going to have enough light or not, right, buy one of these, set it to the lowest level, and try it. And if you decide, you know what, I need a little more light, then bump it up a notch. And you can do the same thing with dimmers. The other advantage of buying a fixture that has the adjustable lumen levels on it is because they do degrade over time, is when they drop a little bit, now you can bump it up a notch, right? So there's advantages of doing that. It's not a necessity, but it's a nice thing if you can find them. The other thing about doing that is both the step, what we call step dimming, or using a dimmer on LEDs is that extends the life. So when LEDs are driven they call them drivers as opposed to a ballast. If you're familiar with old fluorescent ballast, they call them drivers for LEDs. It's the same idea. When you're driving LEDs at their maximum allowable current, that's the lifespan you're going to get out of them based on the ratings. That's how they're tested. But if you dry them at a lower current by dimming them or dropping it using step dimming, they last a lot longer. So you get more life out of your LEDs just by doing that. The other thing I'll mention is that if you're buying lamps, LED lamps for an existing fixture, make sure that if your fixture type is fully enclosed that those fixtures are designed for, lamps are designed for enclosure, otherwise they can overheat. So I know this is technical, I hesitated to put it in here, but it really is not that hard to interpret once you've done a few of these. What this is showing you, the curves in the bottom are showing you is how the light is distributed, right? The red is a front-on view of the light distribution. The blue is showing you at different angles where the light is going to go out like this, right? And this picture on the right is the top view of the fixture. It describes the mounting height, the amount of light, the foot candles you get on the ground versus mounting height. Uh, lots of great information in those. And you know, I, I don't, if you've never looked at them before, they are very confusing to, to look at to begin with. But if you can get these, they will tell you an awful lot about how your fixture is going to perform before you even install it. So controls. So dimmers have always come in many types, right? And they're not all suitable for LED fixtures. Even if the LED fixture says it's good for a dimmer, the dimmer may not be compatible with the LED. So reputable manufacturers should have good information for you describing what their dimmers are compatible with. And likewise, if you buy an LED fixture, it'll tell you what dimmers are compatible with. But my card is out there on the table. So you can email me and ask me questions like that, right? But it's, it is possible with manufacturer information to get those two to mesh, but don't assume that just because it says it's dimmable that every dimmer is going to work with it. That isn't true. Now, the surefire way to get it to work is to use zero to 10 volt dimming, which is widely used in commercial projects, but it requires another set of wires unless you use a wireless system. So it's really applicable to new construction uh, more than any kind of retrofits. 
Timers. So timers like this model made by GE, you can install these in a normal switch box. This is small, it fits right in the place of a switch. So you have to have, you know, my fingers can program it, but if you had any bigger fingers, it wouldn't work. Um, but these will automatically adjust for sunrise and sunset. It, you tell it where you are in the world and it'll adjust for sunrise and sunset. You can set them to come on at sunset and go off a couple hours later and come back on two hours before sunrise. All kinds of scheduling all built right into that timer right there. So they're inexpensive, they're reliable, and they really eliminate completely the need for a photo cell and do a much better job of controlling the light because you can define those time periods that it's on. And you can use them in series with a motion detector if you want so that you've got the time and then it only triggers in that time if there's something there, right? So if you don't want to have something triggering at night, uh, in the middle of the night with a motion sensor, you can use a timer to reduce that, that time that it's on. So how do you find them? These are some screenshots from the darksky.org website. And that's where I'd suggest you, you start um, on their approved products page. And these are far from the only fixtures that'll meet the criteria you should be looking for. But for the most part, this is the best, the most foolproof way to know that what you're ordering is dark sky compliant. Now there are some manufacturers that have fixtures on here that they have variations of that fixture that have a too blue a color temperature. Or they have a variation of the fixture with a different lens on it, right? So you have to be a little bit careful, but by and large, if you look here first, you're gonna be led down the right path. Having said that, I'd also encourage you for the benefit of the darkness of our area to go talk to your local hardware store if, you're gonna, if you buy things at the local hardware store. Uh, we live in Ontario, so I go to Cashton, to Linz, not because of my name, and we go to Wilton, that's, that's the ones we go to. And so when I, a couple of years ago, went to visit them and talked to them about their light fixtures, what I heard from them was that almost every single person who comes in there wants the brightest LED fixture they can buy. And they don't care about the fact that it's full of glare and there's a lens in the front. They don't care about any of that. So my reason for asking you to go talk to your local hardware store when you need a, need a fixture is to try and present to them that there is a demand for this type of fixture, right? Explain to them what we're describing here tonight. That's what you're looking for. They may have to order it in for you. They probably will have to order it in for you. But maybe that'll start to make the gears turn about, hey, there's some demand for this stuff here, right? The same is true at Menards. If you walk into Menards and look at their lighting display, I challenge you to find more than one full cutoff fixture in that wall of fixtures. They just aren't there. So the problem is still there. Home Depot is listed on, the, in fact, that's the Home Depot fixture selection on the Dark Sky uh, site. And they do have a number of Dark Sky fixtures available through Home Depot. Most of them are not in stock in the store. You have to order them online, right? So that's part of the problem is that when people are going out to buy fixtures, they don't want to wait. They just want to get it put up and be done with it, right? So we have to make it easier for them to find these fixtures. We need to create demand for it. So what else? Installations that waste energy means electricity that you buy will always cost more than it needs to for as long as that fixture is there. And that's regardless of how many solar panels get installed, right? A fixture that wastes energy is always gonna waste energy. And if you thought that it's simply installing the most light the project can afford was the best way to add security and safety, you may have been surprised to learn that isn't the case. You may also have been surprised to learn that the color temperature of the light you choose matters to the environment. We really do have a once in a generation opportunity to do this right. And the time to start is today because we know the problem is getting worse every day. So when you look up at the night sky and you take into view in the stars that you can see now, realize that the chance to see them is diminishing each year unless we do things differently. So the take, key takeaways for tonight, keep the color temperature warm, 2700 or 3000 Kelvin. Keep the number of lumens low because high brightness is of no value and waste energy. Buy fixtures that are full cutoff. Keep the light moving down where it belongs and serves the intended purpose. And finally, control the fixtures so they're only on when they're truly needed. As I said, I've got cards out there. You can use that redshiftelectric at gmail.com address to contact me. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. I don't charge for that, uh, that work, that consulting for you. So. I appreciate you coming and I'm available afterwards to answer any questions. Yeah, go ahead. Can we ask 
Sure, go ahead and ask questions, yeah. Um, I'm concerned that light around us has gotten brighter in the last few years. And is that because there are more residential lights? Or, like, I know what's new in Ontario, that those bright commercial lights in Ontario. And mm -hmm. What, you know, how, how far is the impact of those kinds of lights? Like, if they, if they would just fix that, would that make a difference? Or do we, I mean. Right. Do, right. So the. Who should we who should we talk to? So the, I think, just to restate the question for the, for the tape, the question really was is, you know, where is the problem, right? Is it residential lights? Is it commercial lights? You know, the commercial lights we see around us, are they, if we got those fixed, would that solve the problem, right? I think that's the gist of the question. Yes. It's kind of all the above. There's no real way to pinpoint the, the source of that light, but um, as the towns around us, Viroqua, you know, Toma, Hillsboro, Sparta, uh, as they get brighter, that light does light the sky, right? But that said, let's fix what's close to us first and see what happens, right? Yeah. And I really do think that, you know, we've had new fixtures installed in, in Lafarge in the last couple of years. Um, I've seen a lot of evidence of fixtures, like the, the worst case scenario I gave you there was from Wilton, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another one just like it, you know, just south of here. Um, so. I've, I think if we keep working on those kind of things, and I would encourage you to talk to any contacts you have at businesses. You know, for example, if you know people at Organic Valley, if you drive down to Lafarge and, and see lights there that they might own and it could be improved, let them know that. Any business, really, that you deal with and have some influence with, talk to those folks. And certainly residential has an impact too, but I really think, um, you know, in my experience anyway, the biggest single contributor is these wall-mounted lights on commercial buildings that are burning all night long that are unshielded. Yes? My question is kind of related. <clears throat> when you were showing the increase in light, I was wondering about traffic. Do they account for the lights of traffic at all? I mean, certainly any cars that were on the road when those measurements were taken, would, in the John's taken, would contribute to that. I don't know how this professor in um, Madison accounts for that. I really don't. Yeah. Yeah. Concerning the picture you had for the glare over onto the residential area, do residents have a right to claim damages or something? Is it sure. I mean, shouldn't they have right to see cons over? I know zoning is like the worst place. I mean, I don't even want to say what zoning is. Their hands are so tied. Right, so the question was, do the, do the homeowners across the street from that business I showed have any right to not have that light be shining on their house? And depending on what jurisdiction you're in, you know, some cities do have rules against that, but that's kind of just come into place for the most part in the last few years. Middleton just revised their lighting ordinance. I just saw the final draft today, and they have addressed that in their ordinance, and I've worked in places where that's addressed, right? No light spill beyond the property line, or no light spill beyond a certain number of foot candles beyond the property line. Um, in that case, I'm guessing there's no ordinance. I will tell you that I approached that business and it took me, how many weeks, Marla? How many phone calls? Probably four months, phone calls every week, and got to the right person and they came and they tipped those lights down, right? Now, if you drive into there, those lights on the side are still tipped up, but the ones in the front facing the houses were tipped down now, right? So that, we got that little bit of improvement. And a lot of times I think that's where it starts. You have to just try by asking and asking repeatedly and emphatically to get it changed. But ideally, they would have a right to not have that light shine in their house. But yeah, right now it varies a lot. Yep. So the, the impacts here are, probably, the greater light here is about light close to us, not like in La Crosse. Or, I mean, what's impacting our dark sky is more the Immediate surroundings. Yeah, I mean, the, the closer, yeah, so the question is, is the immediate surroundings the problem or is it lacrosse? And I think that's a little bit unknown, right? Because light does travel long distances in the atmosphere and reflect off of clouds and all those kind of things. But I would say that um, it's obvious to me that we've got a lot of lighting problems that have been introduced here locally, right? And I think we've got a better chance of changing that yeah. than we do of changing lacrosse. Yeah. So. Or Toma, right? Yeah. Exactly. So this group that's been volunteering to try and get the dark sky park has done a lot of outreach. 
right? I've given talks in, I don't know where I went, Wausau, and talked in, in uh, Middleton, right, and other things, and we're trying to spread that message more statewide, but I think we have the best chance of changing things right here in this county, right here at home. So that's what I'm hoping will come out of letting you all know, you know, we aren't gonna get it. We're not gonna get that dark sky park. And not only that, the way the problem is changing so quickly, it's not just the dark sky park, it's just gonna, the, the night's gonna get lighter and lighter and lighter. And think of the impacts on all these other species, not just viewing the stars, all these other species and what that's gonna do, so. Yeah. Have you spoken with, um, I mean, we as consumers spoken to like the Oakdale Electric or any of those places to motivate them to go to their customers and say, hey, we'll put shields on your lights. I mean, that kind of, I mean, is that a medium that you could see going on? I mean, especially the smaller electric co ops, I think you could have more impression on them. I agree. So the question was, has an approach been made to the electrical cooperatives to try and get them to engage in this effort, to try and put shields on lights or do something to, to reduce the amount of lighting? And I have spoken personally to two co-ops, um, one in Richland County and one in Vernon County, and um, very limited success. I'm not a customer of either one of them, right? So I think to answer your question, if you are a customer of those utilities, I think the more people they hear from that have that concern, the better things will be. Um, I'm working with Richland County right now to do an inventory of all the county-owned lighting, and they're interested in engaging and trying to have a, make changes to the county-owned lighting, and I've started the same thing with Vernon County, county-owned lighting. But, you know, I'm only one person, and so it, it takes a lot of effort to go out and do those inventories and come up with solutions and prepare a report for them, and I, I don't get paid for it. So if you're a customer of any of these businesses, be it co-ops or some other large business, and you see a problem, I would love for as many of you as possible to address that with them as a customer and try and influence those decisions. So, yeah, that'd be great. So, yeah. Does the packaging on the, um, the down full cutoff lighting have anything to um, tell the potential purchaser what kind of cost it would be as compared to you buy a new water heater, it says, you know, X number of dollars per year to run. And if they could compare that cost, reducing the lumen, lumens and everything, right. as compared to the standard fixtures out there, uh, people may make that choice because in today's world, if they can save a buck, they're going to. Mm -hmm. and, and that would maybe be a way to uh, motivate people to oh, I'm going to save a few dollars every year. Right. So the question was, does the packaging on these fixtures have any kind of energy use that would be comparable to comparing a water heater of one quality to another quality, right, that would show that by using a full cutoff fixture, you can reduce the lumens, reduce the watts, and therefore save energy, right, and, and help pay back the additional cost of the fixture if there is any additional cost. Uh, not that I've seen. I like the idea. Um, you know, quite honestly, I've, I've worked in the commercial realm my entire career. And so in the commercial world, with the, the manufacturers that are large manufacturers, very reputable manufacturers, this has been around, I've been specifying dark sky fixtures for 25 years, okay? Full cutoff fixtures for 25 years. But the vast majority of fixtures that get put on buildings aren't specified by engineers like me. And so the manufacturers that you generally are gonna go to to get fixtures for your house, or even fixtures for a small commercial building, the electrician's gonna go by, don't have the same level of engineering, they don't have the same level of, I would say, concern for providing those types of fixtures. So it's more of a challenge to get them to even build them in the first place. Um, so I, I like the idea. Um, how we pull that off, I, I don't know, but I like the idea, yeah. Maybe just spreading the message that if you put a full cutoff fixture versus a non-full cutoff fixture, you can reduce the lumens by 50% and save that much energy. But we have to get that out there to more people. So, yeah. Do electricians working out in the field, maybe like for, as a homeowner, do electricians know of all this? Like if we would contact our electricians, say we'd like to convert our exterior our deck lights or something to, to meet this dark sky requirement. Yeah. Would they know what we're talking about? Can we start by looking for the right fixture or can we talk to them first? 
the question was, if they go to your, if you go to your electrician, are they going to know what we're talking about? Are they going to understand and, and be able to provide you this kind of fixture? That's going to vary a lot. But I, I've spoken to groups of electricians, um, and even you know the electricians have varying levels of sympathy for whether the frogs are going to live better or not, right? Or whether we're going to waste energy or whether we're going to see the stars. So it's a it's across the spectrum in terms of level of concern and level of interest in it. But I'm the homeowner. I'm the one directing this. Right? Yes, correct. Right. So I think um, some might. I would say the majority won't, because most of what I see installed now is bad in terms of being full cut off and being too bright in the wrong color temperature. And even when I've talked to electricians and tried to direct them in a way that would turn that, it hasn't really sunk in. And part of it is because the sources they go to, 90% of the fixtures their sources sell are bad. They're, they're glare bombs. And that's what they install every day. And somebody says, I want the most light I can possibly get. So that's what they install. But as a customer, I think the most effective way to be to educate yourself, like you've done coming here tonight, if you really are interested in doing that in your own property, reach out to me, right? And I can help you pick some fixtures. And then you could go to your electrician and say, this is what I want installed, right? It might be that, you know. I got, go ahead. If there are large floodlights on like a power pole, but it's, you know, in the country and on somebody's property, can yep. you assume since it's on the power pole that it's owned by that power company, or is that not? Uh, generally, that's true, and those are usually handled on a rental basis. So you pay a little extra on your monthly power bill, and you get that yard light. So that's generally speaking, that's true, how that works. So you would want it, then you would have to probably talk to the homeowner to say, could you turn this off at night? Right. And generally, those, you know, my experience with those yard lights provided by a utility is generally speaking, they're not operable. They're just tied to the service at the pole, and they stay on all night. Right, but they could say, I don't want that light anymore and take it down entirely or replace it with one of their own that they could control, right? Yeah. Yeah, actually, the, the cooperatives used to give a um, kind of a, a really low rate on those, those lights that stay on all night long. Right. And they tout them as security lights. Has anyone ever actually done a study of the this regarding security of having a standing light on your property that tells people that there is a property there. Uh, right. I lived on a farm which had a utility light, but it was on a switch. And at night, when you didn't need it, turn it on. Right. It was turned on. Yep. And very simple, of course, to make a dust light, which doesn't make sense either, I guess, but one that you could turn on and off. Right. So I, what his comment was that, you know, has there been any research done that shows the effectiveness of lighting out in a farm, for example, with a pole-mounted light burning all night? Um, I can't speak to, the, to farms exactly, but we have brochures out here that are provided by the Dark Sky Association that refer to studies. And if you go to the website, there have been numerous studies done relating lighting to crime. And what, one of the things they found is that in some of these studies that the more well-lit areas had higher incidences of graffiti and vandalism, right? right? Because apparently, you know, I, I'm not afraid of the dark. My wife and I, we go around in the dark all the time, right? It's, we don't have lights on the outside of our house except when visitors are coming to find our stairs. But I think human nature in general is many, many people are somewhat afraid of the dark. Apparently criminals are no different, right? And so I, I think there are certainly studies out there that would, would support your idea that having that light there is not an enhancement for security. Um, so, yeah. Just um, as a thought to continue on with what this lady said about um, electricians, I don't know if, say your, your, your program here or something more in depth could be uh, incorporated into the continuing education that the state wants all electricians to continue with and that would maybe bring some awareness to what this is and, and maybe that's been thought of or talked about but it would certainly um, 
bring all electricians a little bit of knowledge to what's going on. Right. The, the question was, could this, be, could this kind of effort be incorporated into the continued education requirements that electricians have to, to do? Um, the presentation I made in, wherever it was, Wausau, I think, was to a continued education uh, s series of days, right, for the Wisconsin Electrical Technical Council, um, made up of many electricians. And so they were willing to let me speak there on this topic. Whether or not we could ever get it incorporated into the requirements, that'd be great. I would love that. Um, for it. Right, right, exactly. People would, go listen. would go listen, right? The other thing I will tell you is that uh, having been in this industry for a long time, one of the things that's frustrating for me personally is that even when there are rules in place about what you have to do in terms of lighting control, and those are generally driven by energy codes, there is nobody who enforces those. So I had to submit my designs for review, it was, it was a long form we had to put in how many watts we were installing and the kind of controls we were installing, all those kind of things. Honestly, I don't know if anybody ever looked at it. And from my personal experience, when stuff comes out into the field, the inspectors that come out to look at things, the last thing in their mind is energy. It's all about safety, which is appropriate. The safety should come first. But it's a frustrating thing that we have laws in place that should require things like motion detectors on commercial building exterior lighting but you'll see all kinds of fixtures installed that don't have those, right? So I agree with the idea of educating electricians, and if we found sympathetic electricians, I think that could be a benefit. Um, yeah. Did they do their safety inspections during the day or at night? Yeah, right. That photo you showed about the individual standing in the fence or in the gateway. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, do they do the inspections in the day or night? They do them in the day. Um, so, yeah, which is part of the problem with you wouldn't notice those things, yeah. And one other question I had, too. So I know that there are noise ordinances. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the one I'm thinking of, we live outside of the town of Westby. And uh, several years back, um, one of the dryers, uh, corn dryers, in the industrial area. I think I want to, well, we could hear it, which is roughly seven, five miles. Five miles. And um, if I'm not mistaken, they, they were able to uh, stop it. They got it fixed. So encroachment, environmental, or un unwanted encroachments, mm -hmm. does the light situation fall under especially if there's health concerns, um, people who are exposed to unwanted light, um, such as maybe the lights that are on utility poles, this contractor uh, coming into their yard, is encroachment ever considered, unlawful encroachment taken into consideration? Yeah, so the question was, is, uh, is there a parallel between light trespass and sound as a as an unwanted encroachment on other properties. And again, that varies a lot by jurisdiction. So, um, you know, there are local townships here, and I did a little research on this three years ago now, but I haven't touched it since then, so I apologize for not having this committed to memory, but there are townships around us here that have lighting ordinances already in place. And many of them are quite old, and so, for example, when they were written, LEDs didn't even exist or weren't used, right? So they're written around metal halide, written on high pressure sodium. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's the next, I, I'm the kind of person that I'm always of the mindset, I wanna educate people, and I wanna persuade them to make this change just because it's the right thing to do. But I will tell you personally, the evidence I've seen over the last two years from how fast this is changing, I'm now of the mindset that we need to work in parallel and also look at ordinances. And uh, that's why I worked with Middleton um, and other places looking at you know, how we can revise our ordinances. I've compiled a list of ordinances. Um, and I kind of think that's the next tier is to look at doing that and to update the ordinances that already exist. But I think you're right. I mean, I think the idea of light trespass being an equivalent to noise, I think is, a, is an apt one. I think it's an appropriate one. So, Paul, you had a question? I don't know. I always had exactly that point. It, the most useful term I've heard tonight is light trespass. I mean, we're all used to physical trespass, you know, hunters or whatever, permission or not. We're kind of used to sound, 
trespass a barking dog all night, mm -hmm. you know you can call somebody, and maybe it will do something. But then light trespass, that, that's a new term for me, and that's very useful for encapsulating this problem. Okay. So Paul's comment was that the term light trespass is new to him and is a useful term to think about when you're thinking about problems with lighting. Um, and if you go to the darksky.org website, they've got you know, some, some writing about that, some ideas about that. Um, and there are, there are ordinances in different jurisdictions that directly address that. So, so yeah. in this increase in the past couple of years, the residential situation hasn't changed much. But Walmart, for example, a huge parking lot, lit 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. high intensity lights. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would seem that, that it might be affected, or perhaps, to uh, concentrate on making these large box stores and malls aware of, of the impact of their lighting. Mm -hmm. We're 12 miles from La Crosse, down deep in a valley. And at night, you can see the sky go from, from La Crosse. Right. And that sky go is coming from Walmart and other people. But, but large boxers, and they're the ones that seem to be increasingly light, lighting their, their outdoors. The residential, I mean, really, the it's not increased that much in my opinion. Yeah. So the point was that, you know, uh, from your perspective, the residential problem really hasn't grown here. The residential lighting problem hasn't grown here, but there are large installations, especially remote from here, uh, big box stores that have parking lots that are lit all night that are really lit very brightly. And would that be a better approach to try and focus the energies, I guess, on getting that changed? And that's a fair point. Um, I'll tell you my limited experience with trying to work through corporate-owned properties um, trying to get to the right person and trying to have any influence over them because most of them have, even the one I worked with here, have national design standard people, but then they aren't implemented properly or aren't implemented you know, um, uniformly throughout their installation. So I agree that that's a big part of the problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, there really is, it's, it's all part of the problem and where to focus the energy is, is hard to know because for the same amount of energy, you may work for months and not get anywhere. Um, it t oftentimes takes finding the right person to be your champion inside the organization. And I would tell you, again, I guess go back to the idea of uh, not knowing what any of you do for a living or where you work or anything else about you. If you think when you go home tonight, what contacts you have, what people do you know in places that are decision makers? I'm helping Mount Horeb right now trying to figure out what they can do about their street lights. They just spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars putting LED street lights in, they put them in at 4,000 Kelvin, and now people are concerned. So now the question is, well, if you want us to change these out, it's another $170,000, right? So the point is to try and get to those decision makers before that decision gets made, before it's too late. And I've done a lot of that, but I don't have as many contacts as all of you do. So that's one thing I would tell you, is just think about any people you know that might know somebody who's a decision maker, and before things get talked about, before things get changed, to encourage them to take this approach to their lighting. Yeah, I think you could show Walmart that you could go to 2700 Kelvin and lower lumens and pull cut off and still provide a friendly environment for your customers mm -hmm. and save money. Right. That might be a very effective way to approach it. Right. So the, the comment was, you know, if you went to Walmart and, and shared this information with them, it might be a, a good economic argument for them. I will tell you that Walmarts that I'm aware of that have put lighting in the last, say, 10 years, those are full cutoff fixtures. And they may not look like it because the poles are 70 feet tall, right? So when you're, you're underneath them, you're in the glare zone because you're in the parking lot. But if you went far enough away, you would see that they actually are full cutoff fixtures. Now, they are unlikely, unless there's good enforcement of the rules, they're unlikely to stop at the property line, right? right? Um, and I will tell you, having done a lot of calculations and submitted a lot of calculations like that, if you wanted to, you could manipulate those numbers. 
to look good for an, ins for an inspector, right, if you're dishonest about it. Um, but they are, they are at least in my experience full cutoff, but they're usually 4,000 Kelvin, so they're too blue. And they're, in my opinion, over lighting their parking lots, which is true of most places. And you know, I'm sure one of their concerns is they think that they might get sued if somebody gets hurt in that parking lot, and therefore over lighting is better than under lighting it. So, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned two blue. Is uh, when you're talking about 4,000, 5,000 Kelvin versus the warmer color temperatures, is that analogous to people turning off their TVs, changing their computer screens at night, that kind of thing, in terms of uh, physiologic health on humans? Yeah, so the question was when I say the lights are too blue, is that analogous to blue light from screens in the house, for example, or your phones at night, and what impact it has on circadian rhythms and your ability to sleep is exactly the same. It's exactly the same problem. Yep. In addition to the problem of it having more scatter, producing more glare. So you've noticed if you're driving down the highway more and more and more with LED headlights showing up on cars, those headlights by and large are 5,000 Kelvin and above. And that's why you see that scatter. That's why you see that, that problem, right? So. Well, I know we're past, we're past 8 o'clock, so I don't want to keep anybody, but if you have any other questions. Uh, what's that? Outside lighting, thank you. Um, if you're interested, I'm hang, I'll hang around as long as you want to talk about this. Um, if you go outside here and look, I will tell you that the parking lot lights here that I changed out two years ago, Jason, we did that, I think. Um, we reduced the light output of those fixtures by 75%. And we took a shallow sag lens and made it flat, right, and changed the color temperature. Uh, the building lights that are on here, they were 75, I think they were 75 watt metal halide. Um, I think they're 12 watt LEDs now, and we reduced the lumens greatly in there and added shielding to the sides so the light is down, which is not an ideal way, honestly, right? The better way is to replace those fixtures with a fixture designed for that, but it works, and it was inexpensive to do. So as you leave, uh, you know, take a look at what's out here now. You'll notice that the bollards outside in front are very blue. Those are 5,000 Kelvin bollards. What's that? What's a bollard? You don't know about bollards, sorry. So the bollards are the short four-foot lights that are out here by the sidewalk in front of the building. That's a bollard. And those are 5,000 Kelvin. So they're still on the agenda to get changed, but uh, the rest of the lights around here have been changed to better color temperature and lower levels. All right, thank you all for attending. Yeah. <laughs>